Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we will speak with the executive team of Room to Read, a global nonprofit focused on educating children and particularly on access to education for girls. Our guests are Gita Morali, Room to Read's Chief Executive Officer, Heather Simpson, the Chief Program Officer of Room to Read, and Sherry Free. Uh, the Chief Financial Officer. Thank you all for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. It's wonderful to talk about Room to Read uh, and, and a room, not only a room to read, but also room to learn to read, to, to have the space to actually, and the support to actually learn to read. Gita, could you talk about the mission? And particularly, let's also focus on the whole idea of equal access to education of, of girls and boys, because it is such an important topic, um, and you have a sixty million dollar uh, budget. You you try to uh, push out this mission. Talk about your founding and, and where you are today. Thanks, Mark. Thanks so much for having us. Well, Room to Read is a global organization focused on creating a world free from illiteracy and gender inequality through education. We envision a world where every child can be fulfilled and have the necessary skills to contribute solutions to the world's most pressing challenges in their families, in their communities, and in the world. Room to Read was founded in 2000 with the initial objective of providing books to children without access. Our founders embarked on a journey um, from launching a bootstrap startup to eventually capturing the imaginations of investors like Bill Draper and Don Valentine, Jeff Skoll. From there, Room to Read just evolved into this global organization that we are today with a bold goal of solving children's illiteracy in our lifetimes and giving children, especially girls, the right to quality education, no matter where they're born or to whom they happen to be born. Uh, through our literacy portfolio, we support children to become independent readers, lifelong learners. We train and coach teachers, create quality books and curricular materials, establish libraries filled with children's books in local languages that can be enjoyed at school or at home. And we partner with local communities governments and the publishing industry to implement models that help children succeed in school and develop a love of reading. With our girls' education work, we ensure that girls build the skills they need to succeed in school and to make key life decisions. We prepare girls to make positive change by providing life skills curriculum, opportunities for mentorship and peer support. We work with their families and communities on a day-to-day -day basis um, to help solve the challenges that girls may be facing to continue through school. But the work goes further by supporting young people of all genders to build the knowledge and skills they need to create a gender equal world. But I think the most important piece is that our programs work. Children two to three times faster on our programs than their peers. When, and when we survey young women who've graduated from our program, graduates who are five years removed from programming, 93% are either enrolled in further education or have found employment. Uh, to give you a sense of breadth, our programs have benefited almost 20 million children across 16 countries and 37,000 communities, and we aim to benefit 40 million children by 2025. And while our work started in Asia and grew to several countries across Asia and Africa, we've now launched projects in the Middle East, Latin America, and the United States with a view to share our expertise wherever we can further our mission. Now um, Heather, when you look at the programs, the, one of the things that I find to be so interesting is that every country, every culture has its own version of a caste system. Sometimes they're called caste systems. Sometimes it's based in race. Sometimes it's based in stature. Uh, sometimes it's based in gender. Isn't this whole idea of, of providing an equal educational opportunity, isn't it also a... a um, a reality that these kinds of activities uh, challenge embedded inequ inequities in all of our societies, and and no society is is um, is exempt, right? In the United States, we have an uh, inequality, and as soon as we educate people, it shifts that inequality. Is part of what you're doing trying to um, to challenge this notion that people um, are in, are um, constantly um, advantaged or disadvantaged based in education, and you're just trying to give people the ability to, to thrive within the context in which they live. 
Broomtreed recognizes that education is a fundamental human right and that every child, no matter where they were born, who their family is, what their caste, what their economic situation is at the current time being, that it is their right to learn. And Room to Read focuses on that fundamental human right. And, and across the board with ministries of education, with family members, with leaders, they recognize the power of education. And we work in partnership with these ministries, with these community members to make sure the supports we're doing to support literacy acquisition, life skills development is done in a culturally sensitive way, is done in a gender sensitive way. And so we're opening those doors rather than shutting the doors. If, if we approached this differently and didn't recognize cultural differences, cultural nuances, we might hit a lot of roadblocks in that process. But Room to Read, we have, our, most of our staff members are from local communities, from the countries in which we're working. And that makes all the difference in making sure we're approaching education in a really sensitive way. Yes, it's challenging, the, the hierarchy and sometimes power dynamics. We absolutely are committed to this fundamental right that every child deserves the right to learn. So it's not a neo-colonialist approach. It's basically an approach in which you're coming in with an understanding um, of the culture. And if you don't have that understanding, you try to acquire that understanding as you also try to deliver on your mission to create an educated um, uh, populace, basically giving everybody the tools required to, to thrive, right? That's right. So it's a science-based approach. We are looking at the brain research of how children develop their literacy skills, how they develop their life skills from a scientific perspective. And we're marrying that with the cultural sensitivities that we know we must approach these um, interventions with. Now, with, with this type of a, a effort, there's considerable expense and there's considerable management of resources because a dollar cannot be spent twice for two different uh, different uh, uh, purposes. Shari, uh, could you talk a little bit about how you manage the funding um, to ensure that every dollar has resonance uh, for its purpose? Well, I love that you said that every dollar can't be spent twice. I'm sure if, room to, if, if there were a way, Room to Read would have found a way to do it already. <laughs> um, but we're incredibly, um, that we're incredibly proud of the way that we manage our funds. We're, we're obsessed with um, efficiency and effectiveness of taking our donors' money, which we consider to be incredibly um, our most precious, one of our most precious resources. And how we utilize it and deploy it is really important. Um, we spend roughly 85 cents on every dollar in, in pursuit of delivering programmatic um, so 85 cents of every dollar goes directly to the front line. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. That's correct. It goes to delivering our programs. And that's a really important metric that has been in our DNA from the very beginning. As Geetha said, right from the start, we founded with this, with this sense of how we would build an organization. And over the years, we've invested in our people and processes and infrastructure that allow us to continuously scale, but also how we think about our return on mission and how we think about taking a dollar and maximizing the way that it will get um, equal the number of children that we could potentially impact. And so we look at things all the time on ways to streamline our processes, improve the way that we deliver our programs and the way that we deliver outcomes so that we can touch and reach more children every year. And so if you look at the last five years, for example, our strategic plan from 2015 to 2019, we invested, I don't know, I think it was $250 million, something like $250 million of um, our resources and program expense and we impacted 9 million children. In this current strategic plan, we'll invest about $350 million and we'll be impacting 20 million children. So it's a 45% increase in just how efficient we are at delivering our programs and using our donors' money um, to impact children. 
Now, I'm really interested, Gita, in terms of how you shape the organization, because it's very complicated to shape an organization that has to work across different cultures. I mean, that is, that is such a challenging thing, right? Because you've got, you've got sort of the, the competencies that, that Sherry were, uh, was talking about. So these are technical competencies or Heather's uh, competencies in terms of developing consistent offerings that can then be scaled. But then you also have boots on the ground. You have partners. How, how do you see the challenge of, of creating that organization that, that has the right balance between a sort of centralized efficiencies, but then also an ear to the local concerns uh, of how one should operate within country? It's a great question. The way that we've built this organization, the types of leadership that we recognize and grow are critical to our ability to deliver. So if you look at our leadership team, it's a combination of our management team, three of us are here today, um, but it also includes our regional directors and our country directors. And when we talk about any shifts in our strategic direction, when we talk about the initiatives that we'll be investing large dollars in, it is a collaborative effort to talk through where the greatest needs are around the world and where we can add the most value. When we made the shift from simply delivering programs that were sort of a demonstration model to really show the quality of the programming, that was a collective effort. And as we made that transition into an organization that's now delivering systemic change, working with governments at scale in the way that Sherry just described, that's also a collaborative effort. It requires us having centralized systems that support our global portfolio, but it also allows for a certain nuance in the way that we produce local contextual materials and the way that we engage with governments and the ways that we sign agreements, the types of things we will and will not do. And that is something that our country leadership works with us on an annual basis to identify those priorities and deliver upon them. Uh, we just asked a poll, uh, we just completed a poll in which uh, 27 people voted. We asked whether it's important that America invest in educating children who live in low income communities outside of the US. 93% uh, believed uh, yes. We'll see uh, how the next poll go. It's uh, the, the two are in uh, juxtaposition with each other. I'll also remind attendees that you can ask questions. We'll try to bring them here. Uh, one of the things you said, Gita, are, are there are things that you won't do that you're sometimes asked to do. Um, what kind of things are they? And, and, pretty, and, and Heather, uh, take this, or, or Gita, you can take it. What kind of things are you asked to do that it, are just not consistent with your missions? Yeah, I, I'll start and maybe Heather jump in. You know, we are laser focused on our mission, and that is a focus on early grade literacy and secondary school um, education for girls and, and a focus on gender equality in, in that regard. Outside of that, we um, will say no to just about anything. <laughs> and I think as we've evolved as an organization, um, there is the tendency to, to believe that we have the resources to do um, all kinds of different things, be it bleed into healthcare or environmental issues or um, you name it, right? Um, we will take on certain thematic areas, but only through the context of our books um, in the way that we produce children's books. For example, we now are producing a, a series on um, the impact of COVID for children around the world. We're producing a series around peace and equality, again, for uh, early grade readers. Um, so we do try to find ways to make our content relevant and help children learn how to read or help girls um, identify the challenges in their own lives and address them. But outside of that, we will not take on other things. And I think that's what has allowed us to scale to the uh, level that we have. It's allowed us to build an organization with the technical expertise and operational expertise needed to deliver. Um, and, and truly on an annual planning cycle, you'll see us ask ourselves, how many things can we actually take off the plate? Because we're always asked to do a lot and there's a lot of opportunity to do good in the world, but our ability to deliver and be efficient is a function of our ability to say no. So it's really focus. And, and that really comes back to Shari, your point about 85%, right? As soon as you lose focus, you start having to redesign, uh, invest in more infrastructure and so on. And you cannot, um, you can't really continue to hit that kind of, of uh, 
distribution of resource so that 85% really goes to the front line, right, Sherry? That's right. I mean, I think that the best organizations in the world are committed to focusing their resources on the most important parts of the business. And, and that's how you spend your, we spend our resources. We are innovative. We test new things. We, we definitely test new things and we try new things, but we hone what, what works. And we continuously talk among our leadership team on trying new things, but also getting rid of things that don't work. And we have over the years been very, you know, I think our, in our early years, we had a computer room, a computer lab. We've done all sorts of things that, that as it turns out, doesn't necessarily add to the literacy you know, component with children learning to read or girls staying in school. And I think as, as we've evolved, we've learned and we really pride ourselves on being a learning organization. And so we continue to learn and grow as, as, a, as a team. We just completed the second uh, uh, poll, which is really about whether it's important to, that, that uh, US investors uh, invest in gender equality education. Um, mm -hmm. And we had a similar result in investing to education and children. So this, it seems that there's a, there's a huge amount of, of alignment between investing in children and the way to invest, which is ensuring that all children uh, have equal access. So Heather, as you, um, hire people for your programs um, outside of the U.S. Could you talk a little bit about um, how that actually functions? Because mm -hmm. you're dealing with a lot of different languages. It's very difficult to manage remotely. And uh, no matter how culturally astute you are, there are cultures that you won't know, this, this group here won't know, even your members of your team won't know. How do you um, navigate that whole issue of bringing people on who will be effective locally, retaining them, um, making sure that information flows as, as required for efficient operations so that uh, Sherry's uh, um, uh, um, statement of resources and resource distribution is, is really um, honored. Uh, how, does that, how does that all work? As Gita mentioned, our um, leadership structure includes our country directors, our regional directors. And so for most of our operating programs, it's happening in countries of operation. So, so the country directors are hiring their, their that's operating right. unit. So that's your, right. your challenge is finding somebody who really understands the education landscape within that country, right? That's correct. And we include that in our hiring criteria. We have our interview process, et cetera. And then we also have a team that I supervise um, of technical experts who provide technical assistance across our whole portfolio, across all the countries. And about a third of those people live and work in the United States and travel and, and right now do a lot of Zoom calls. Um, and about two thirds of them are living in Asia and Africa as well. And so we're hiring local experts who are steeped in knowledge and also understand this, this, the cultural nuances, as you say. And we have this global team that is providing learning across the different parts of the room to read organization. And Gita, could you talk about impact? So you have the, these team members, you have the local organizations, but really the rubber hits the road when a girl um, is, is sitting in classroom. How many people are affected? And, and if you can break down a little bit by age group and the kinds of education you provide, that would be wonderful. Yeah, so as I was um, mentioning, we, by the end of this year, will have benefited 20 million children through our programs the vast majority are through our literacy interventions, largely because uh, government systems were already really focused on ensuring that children learn how to read and it was a part of the education system. We are in many places still fighting an uphill battle when we talk about the importance of girls being educated and continuing through school and governments to varying degrees accept that as a part of their system versus not. So uh, we're continuing to work on building programs that will allow for system level change on the literacy front, continuing to accelerate that work, but also to shed a light on the importance of life skills education um, for girls specifically so that they can address gender specific challenges that they may be facing. We do have a set of what we call global indicators that we measure 
um, from all of our project sites on an annual basis. These are things like uh, the fluency of children who are reading on our programs, um, things like the competency girls have in, in various life skills to make sure that the ultimate impact on um, learning and life outcomes is what we envision it to be. And as both Heather and Sherry were indicating, we're very focused on being a learning organization. So we look at how our programs are doing on an annual basis, where they may be struggling, where they may need additional supports or uh, different components that might help in terms of uh, addressing these outcomes. And then we'll invest more heavily in those areas to evolve our programming accordingly. Are there ways in which you can look at the downstream impacts? Because very often education is simply mm -hmm. measured um, by how many hours are in classrooms, mm -hmm. or uh, sometimes it's it's um, it's it's by age group. But it's very difficult sometimes to measure the downstream impacts, either in terms of uh, economic impact, uh, health um, outcomes, which an educated pop, uh, population. Um, is better equipped to take care of their own health needs. Um, there, there might be other impacts, just, just happiness, you know, uh, kids being happy, being in school. Um, do you, do you, do you uh, try to take a cut at that? Yeah, we're, um, you know, because we're 20 years old now, we have the advantage of seeing children who have made their way through our program and uh, have established themselves, you know, as adults giving back to their community. We have um, many, many stories. For example, we've just recently been um, speaking with uh, Dr. Sanjay in Nepal, who was on our literacy program very early in his life and is now a doctor on the front lines uh, fighting COVID. So, um, you know, we definitely have the individual stories. Um, from a system perspective and a process perspective, we do collect quite a lot of data over time. And we're one of few organizations that collect similar indicator data across so many countries over uh, such a long period of time. And now we're doing quite a lot of work with the um, graduates of our girls education program, tracing where they end up one year after graduation, five years after graduation, looking at things like the type of employment trajectories they take, um, their age at marriage, their age at uh, motherhood, et cetera. So those sorts of indications will give us a really good sense of the moments, the decision-making moments um, in a girl's life and where we can add the most support to ensure that she's able to, as you say, be fulfilled and make the best decisions um, for herself and her family. And Heather, has, has the COVID situation impacted uh, your people on the ground? Because uh, it seems to impact everybody, but we don't, we don't seem to report as, as much about the frontline um, uh, impacts of, of providers like educators, uh, particularly on the ground in different countries. How are your people um, experiencing COVID today? Absolutely. This has been the biggest education emergency the world has seen in, you know, recent history. Over 90% of every child of school age going age um, has been impacted by school closures at some point during this time. So our teams, as soon as school started closing, our teams started reaching out to all the girls in our programming and checking in with them, making sure they were okay, and started providing remote mentoring support to those girls, knowing that adolescent girls especially are extremely vulnerable in these types of humanitarian disasters. They're often the first to get pulled out of school when, when family's economic situation goes low. They're often the, the people in a family who are tapped to take care of ill relatives. So we knew these girls were very vulnerable of the longer they're not in a classroom, the li more likely they're never returned to that classroom. So we started immediately reprogramming the way we work and our um, colleagues in different countries were using phones, they were using text messages to, to reach out to the girls. On the literacy side too, we knew that children who already were literate were in a much better position to continue learning, even if they weren't able to go to an in-person classroom and see their teacher in person. And so we needed to make sure that those children who were just starting to develop their liter literacy skills continued on their learning journey. So we started partnering with local 
local radio programs to to broadcast literacy instruction over the airwaves, local television stations, national television stations to also do instruction both on literacy as well as life skills programming for adolescents. And it's taken every person in this organization to really pivot how we think about operating, how we organize ourselves, and how we reach out to those teachers, those parents, and those students in partnership with these ministries of education who do care deeply and want to have their children come back to school when they're reopened and learn during this period. Um, and it's taken a lot of, of creative problem solving. And Sherry, does, has, has the COVID situation affected the uh, internals uh, much? Because you have to keep your people safe, of course. Um, fundraising becomes very difficult when you can't gather in groups. Um, everything has to happen by Zoom. Um, there are other challenges. Um, has it had a big impact or is it mostly on the front lines? Oh, no, I think COVID um, has had an impact on every organization. Globally, I think there's nobody who's, who's sort of like um, on the downside and on the upside um, in this in this environment. For us, we went right away. I mean, we really did think very quickly about how this was going to impact us financially as well as operationally. I mean, the very first thing we did was make sure that every one of our 1,600 employees was safe and home. And so we locked down our offices around the globe and sent everyone home. We, um, you know, and we made sure that they had the resources that they could to be able to communicate and do their jobs. I mean, not everybody has great access to internet in, the, in some of our field office remote areas where people live, but for the most part, our ability to connect and, and assure ourselves that we have a, a staff that's safe and able to work from home. We also recognized that we would not be able to have five of our galas, which happen in Asia in the very early part of the year. They started with Mar you know, in March and April and they fell pretty quickly. We optimistically postponed a few of them, postponed a few of them, thinking that they, we would have them in September or October. We just had no idea the impact of how, how big COVID would be and around the globe. Um, and we rebudgeted right away. I mean, we did a massive rebudgeting across our, our world in terms of being able to, you know, take expenses that were non-personnel. We made a decision not to impact our personnel um, expenses. We wanted to hold on to all of our staff um, through this process. And we made some, what we thought were hard decisions and some were very easy decisions. The reality was we simply couldn't travel. We couldn't, you know, there were things we just couldn't do. And so they came off the table pretty quickly. Um, we're learning to rebudget quickly multiple times. We've done several rebudgeting processes during the course of the year. And our board of directors, who are some of our biggest donors, but are so engaged, we've been meeting with them on a monthly basis. We normally meet three times a year. We've been checking in on a monthly basis to make sure that things, that we have the resources we need, and they're matched with the way that we're spending money. Um, and we've been challenged to redeploy resources where we would normally be on the ground in certain countries spending money, we are using them to actually make advances on things like our, our, um, our literacy cloud, you know, so that we can be delivering um, our, our children's books in various languages to ministries of education and others who can, you know, who can actually tap into those platforms. So we're redeploying the resources actively during the course of the year. And we're spending a lot of time thinking about how we can best get the most out of the resources we have. It's really an all in effort, isn't it, Gita? Absolutely. It's uh, the entire organization um, end to end had to redesign and redeploy very quickly. And the level of flexibility that we've had to demonstrate um, in order to ensure we could meet children wherever they are through whatever mediums they had available to them. Um, you know, that's what we're here for. That's our mission. And we've let that guide us. So we just completed a really interesting poll in which we, we tried to restrict people to selecting uh, one of three answers on the best way to educate children in low-income communities. And what was interesting to me is that it's still tilted toward technology, 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 technology. Um, uh, Heather, if you could comment, and then I'm going to give Gita the last word, could you comment a little bit on, on how important tech is 
versus in personally learning, mentoring, other other aspects that are not technically driven to your mission. So I, I have a ten year old son is in the room next door, online <laughs> learning, and I hear tears every once in a while. So even <laughs> under the best of circumstances, this pivot to emergency use of online learning and tech is is challenging. It's very difficult. And when we look at the children that Room to Read is supporting, many of them have no computer at home, no access to internet. Many of them have never touched a phone, even if someone in their family owns a phone. So we can't just rely on tech. And, and that's why the whole organization has identified a range of no tech, low tech, and high tech solutions to try to meet these children where they are. And really a hard copy book is an incredibly powerful use of technology, appropriate technology for most of the children that Room to Read is serving. So it did take us a little while to figure out how to get hard copy materials out to children. But in the, in the first few months, we were able to figure out some of those supply chains. And it's incredibly powerful to see children reading books listening to radio stations, in some cases where they do have family members with cell phones, reading on cell phones in addition to those hard copy materials have been really important. And this goes for the adolescents as well, getting um, life skills workbooks out to the girls in our program has been a really important solution to helping learning continuity during this time. Plus, you can drop a book, you can share a book, you can gift it, you can have it back, you can reread it, right? I mean, the technology is amazing. I mean, you, you, you can't drop one of these. And, and Absolutely. Right? <laughs> when the lights go out, even in California, and you can't recharge, those books are still there when the sun's up. So, Gita, what's, what's the future of, of the organization and this effort? Um, how are you going to evolve this and, and continue to scale it? Because as, as um, pervasive as your programs are in different countries, they really are literally just scratching the surface of a great need, is, aren't they? isn't it? Yeah, I mean, Mark, this is the reason that Room to Read transitioned as part of this current strategic plan from demonstration to expansion model, as we call it, system level interventions. And, you know, really, as your last question asked, I mean, technology is a means, it's a tool, but ultimately we want scale. And our focus is on strengthening systems for the long term. There are too many project based interventions that are focused on short term results instead of long-term and sustained impact. So that's why some of what Room to Read is doing is working with teacher colleges to provide exemplary teacher training and coaching so teachers can deliver lesson plans at scale, su supply and demand chains for learning materials, family and community engagement to, to impact the culture of reading in communities. These are the types of investments that make systems stronger and um, they enable uh, they enable systems to support children effectively for the long term. And there have been a lot of questions in this polls about, you know, which children do we work with? Where do we invest? Ultimately, education is the one thing that you can't take away. It impacts health, economics, peace. It impacts individuals' income, childhood mortality, the probability of armed conflict. I mean, we are interconnected. And Room to Read is therefore focused on ensuring every child, no matter where they're born, has access to quality education, which is why I also mentioned projects that we're now looking at in the United States where one in six children are, are living in poverty. So inequity can happen anywhere. Um, it is a, a fact and uh, that's what makes our mission all the more relevant um, today. Such an important, important point that, that the mission is relevant across societies, that it can be pursued with respect to in-country sensibilities and cultures that the team that you build can have a balance of different knowledges, uh, the, the cultural sensitivity, the, uh, the, the crisp um, uh, uh, knowledge required to manage finance or fundraising or program delivery. Thank you all for coming uh, and explaining the mission of Room to Read. Uh, Gita Morali, Heather Simpson, and Shari uh, Friedman, and the entire group. Thank you so much for advancing literacy in the United States. And overall in the world and
Thank you so much for your insights. That's the nonprofit report. Uh, stay safe, everyone. Let's uh, mask up and we'll see you on Thursday. Take care.